All right. Well, I was talking this morning to Pastor Mike. I cannot believe I'm up here doing this again. But, but uh, I must have did an okay job since he let me come back like a month, month and a half after I did it last time. So I've got something for you guys this morning. I have here a Hershey's bar, a Reese's peanut butter cup, and a bag of M&Ms. Does anybody here know the significance of these three items? They are all chocolate. That's not what's significant about them. They, they probably do have lots of calories. Anybody know? They are. These are the three highest selling candy bars. M&M's number one, Reese's number two, and Hershey's number three. $1.5 billion in annual sales for these candy bars right here. Since you got the question right, would you like to pick one? That was Reese's to me, baby. Reese's? Okay. Now I know what you're asking yourself. What does this candy have to do? What's the, the significance of it in relation to the sermon? Well, it's absolutely nothing. I brought candy here just because I knew it would get you guys' attention. I think, I think it worked because everybody's chomping for a chance to get a little more candy. Now I'm going to ask you guys a question. Actually, I'm going to say a statement. And I would like to know, well, wh whoever can answer first gets their choice of the candy that's left here. Okay, a few of you, Pastor Mike, you're going to know this right away, Brother John, there's a few who are going to know where this verse is at. So give everybody else a chance to look it up before you answer, okay? And now I know everybody's heard this, so get ready. In, whoever can answer first where this verse is at gets their choice, M&M's or Hershey's. God helps those that help themselves. Man. Who said that first? So, Miss Nellie said it. Miss Nellie is 100% correct. That is not in the Bible. Would you like a Hershey's bar or M&M's? <laughs> All right, I still have a Hershey's bar. Annie and I have been dieting, so I don't want to eat this myself. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then uh, so you can win the Hershey's bar here. Does anybody know who actually said that, the modern-day version of God helps those who help themselves? Nobody. Okay. Let me give you, I'll give you a couple hints. It's, I'm talking about the modern day version, the, the one we use now. Think of a founding father of this country. He may, um, he may have told you something like, put on your bifocals or go fly a kite. Ben Franklin! <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, enjoy that, John. Enjoy that. Okay. Okay, it was Benjamin Franklin in the 1757 Poor Richard's Almanac. Um, There's a few people who said it before, but he's the one who phrased it that way. God helps those that help themselves. That is the number one quoted scripture that's not in the Bible. People th think it's in there. It's not. Um, cleanliness next to godliness is number two for just a little fact for you. That's also not in there. But... We're talking about God helps those that help themselves. The reason that is not in the Bible, because it's 100% wrong. It's not true. Okay, I want to give you a little background on why uh, Benjamin Franklin may have said this. Um, his belief system, it was a little different than mine, and probably most of yours. He's what we call, we call now a deist. Um, and let me explain to you, for those of you who don't know what a deist is, I had to look it up myself. A deist is a person who believes we have a God, um, that he created us, that he should be worshipped, 
and that he is interested in us, but he doesn't take a, an actual personal interest. Um, they don't believe in, uh, say, say a deist wouldn't say it's false that Moses had a conversation with the burning bush. They don't believe in any kind of miracles. Um, they do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Um, they believe that Jesus was a man and that somewhere along the way that uh, we corrupted what it says in here. And that's what, that's what deists think. Um, they think Jesus, we should do what he says. He's a great teacher, but he's not God. So with that kind of thinking, um, I could see how someone could come up with a statement like God helps those who help themselves. It doesn't give me a lot of hope when we say uh, God doesn't interact personally with us or God doesn't perform miracles or Jesus is not a God. Now, Benjamin Franklin, he's not around anymore, but there's still some other people that think strongly, like I said, it's the number one quoted Bible verse that's not even in the Bible. So there's others out there that think it. A um, couple of examples. You may be sitting around, I know, I know this happened to me, I've been sitting around at home on a Saturday. Saturday afternoon seems to be a good time, or Saturday morning, late Saturday morning. And we'll be sitting there doing something, and then you hear the on the door, and you go and answer it, and here you've got a couple of uh, little old ladies with pamphlets, and they want to come in, and they want to talk to you about Jesus. And, and besides their pamphlets, they've got something called the Watchtower Magazine. I'm not going to name who these people are, but <laughs> they'll come in, and they'll want to talk to you, because they have to. They have to come around and go to door to door and talk to people. That is, uh, that's one of the, the people, that is one of the groups of people that think God helps those that help themselves. Um, another example, if you've been coming to this church long enough, you've seen a video that Pastor Mike plays. I should have asked him to play it today, but I forgot. I, I, I won't, you don't have to play it, but... There's a video that he plays, and if you've been coming here long enough, you've seen the video because he's played it several times. What you've got when, when you're watching the video, you've got a man sitting on the side of the road, and he's got a sign, I believe, he's asking for money on there. So he sits there with his sign, and you've got another gentleman that pulls up in his car, and the light happens to change red while he's sitting there. And the whole time that he's sitting there waiting for the light to change green, he's thinking... Should I give this guy some money? Should I not? He's probably going to spend it on booze. You know, he's probably lazy, whatever. All the things that are uh, going through that gentleman's mind. And luckily, luckily for the gentleman in the video, the light changes green for him, so he's able to go on without giving any help. Um, I think uh, sometimes when we see poor people, homeless people, um, we may, we may think the same thing. All of us here, at some point, I know I have been guilty of this, thinking that if you would do something to help yourself, God would help you. But it's not true. It's not in the Bible. It's not in there. Um, after a lot of study on this subject, I see it not as God helps themselves, but the way I see it is that God helps the helpless. That's who God helps, is the helpless. Um, and that's the main idea that I want you guys to take home today. That God helps the helpless. Um, you know, this was literally the hardest part of the sermon. Was uh, coming up with scriptures to use for it. Because there's so many, you've got to narrow it down. God helps those that help themselves is in such contradiction with the whole Bible that it was hard to narrow down certain scriptures, um, just certain ones to use for the sermon. It was very, very difficult. 
but, it, but it's biblical. God helps the helpless. Um, I, I, like, I like this one, Isaiah 25, 4. For you have been a defense for the helpless, a, de- a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. God helps the helpless. That, that's biblical. Um, God helps the helpless. And who are the helpless? That's the question. Um, it's not just a homeless man or a sick person. It's all of us. All of us are helpless. Each and every one. Um, we've all turned aside. We've all become corrupt. There's no one, uh, not even one, that does good. I believe that's Psalm 14. I'm, I didn't read it directly. tried to memorize it. Every one of us here is suffering from something. A sin... There's people that are hungry, people that are poor, the sick and the suffering. Everybody, everybody falls in the category under helpless. <clears throat> now, some of us in here have received help already, and that's good. Um, you go outside these doors, and maybe some people in here too still, but you go outside these doors, and there's a lot of people out there that haven't received their help yet. They haven't even heard about the help, possibly, or maybe they're not even ready to accept any help from God. <clears throat> but God helps the helpless. And I think he helps the helpless in many different ways. Um, let's talk about first, let's talk about some worldly worldly things, how he helps the helpless. Um, let's talk about hunger. Hunger is an example. That's one that most of us in here haven't suffered from a lot, I think, inside this building right now. I don't think many of us have suffered from hunger. But you don't have to go very far away. You don't have to travel to Africa or South America to find hungry people. What you say, Pastor Mike, 70% of the kids in this town are on the free lunch program at school or, and, reduced. or reduced lunch. And they get that when school's out during spring break, a lot of these kids don't get lunch. Um, what's the population in this town? 1,500 to 2,000 people? 2,200. And what? And 34. 2,234 people, and we have, I know, one very large food pantry. We have a food pantry here. How many others? We have two food pantries in a town for just 2,200 people. Here alone, you go, go to Champaign, there's even more. You don't have to go very far to find hunger. Um, and there's ways that God deals with helping to ease the hunger of people. Um, now, I, I have a problem with uh, Mr. Franklin. And one of the things his belief system is, and that was that God does not perform miracles. We know in here, the Israelites went walking through the desert for a long time. And everybody here knows how they got fed, right? With manna from heaven. I mean, it rained manna from heaven. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. Um, there was another guy went and sat by a river by the name of Elijah, sat there and got delivery, special delivery from birds with his food. Um, so I have a real problem with miracles. I think there's other people. Miss Amy, I think you'd disagree that there's no miracles. Wouldn't you? No? Well, that's what I'm saying. You disagree that there is no miracles. 
I think we still have miracles. My dad, my grandma, my stepmom and my mom are here. They probably all tell you it's a miracle that I'm alive today, standing up here preaching that they're visiting me instead of visiting me in a jail or something else somewhere. That's probably a miracle to them. I, and it, it's definitely a miracle to me. Um, actually, I saw a miracle in a book. It wasn't the Bible, but it was another book. It was a, it was a miracle I saw when I was about, well, I'd have been about second or third grade. And it's the thing I saw that really made me start believing in God. And I know this was a miracle. I was reading a book about storms. And I saw this picture in there of a town that had been hit by a tornado. Okay, and this town was gone. There was nothing left of this town. And it was showing one house in particular there. This house, there was a, a lady that lived in this house, and she got caught upstairs when the tornado struck. She did not have time to make it off her second floor. And she ran into a closet at the top of these stairs on her second floor, shut the door, and sat in there. And the only thing that was left of her house was a stairway and that closet. I saw the picture of this, and I thought to myself, that is not luck. Nobody is that lucky. If they should, they should be living in Las Vegas. Because nobody's lucky. Only God could have saved that woman. That's a miracle. So I, I disagree with Mr. Franklin and the deists when they say there's no miracles anymore, or, or there ever were. Um, there are miracles. God has fed people through miracles. Another way he deals with hunger is... One, one thing I will agree with the deists on, they say God works through people on here. And I do believe that. He works through us. As a matter of fact, I know my grandma's mad at me because I'm not wearing a suit and tie. And I, I, some others are too. Miss B looks like she may be angry, and Miss Nellie. But, however, I'm wearing this shirt as an advertisement today. 30-hour famine is coming up in April. It's going to be April 27th and 28th. I still need people to help go. So nobody's contacted me yet. Any adults, any teenagers, sixth grade on up that want to go. This is one of the ways God works through us. He's taken a group of individuals and he's put them together and they created World Vision. And World Vision started this back here in the United States so we could help feed people that were starving. I know that he uses us to help each other because he gave us something called spiritual gifts. Okay. He gave us these so for several reasons, but one of the uses is to help each other. Out of curiosity, how many of you know your spiritual gift? Raise your hand. For those of you who don't know your spiritual gift, I'd like to challenge you guys to go home today. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 has two real good lists of it. I'm not going to read them right now. Take them home, read them, pray on them, find out. Don't wait till maybe Thursday night when you're not busy, not something else going on. This is important. Learn what your spiritual gift is so you can use it. You bring glory to God. It's a blessing to you, and you can help someone in need. Um, give you a couple examples, you know, of spiritual gifts. Pastor Mike, he's a prophet. Um, I don't mean he tells the future by being a prophet. Prophet means he speaks the word of God. That's what a prophet is. Um, Y'all know Miss Pam. She's got a great gift of teaching. Uh, Darren, I don't see him in here. Um, he's got a great gift of serving. Um, my wife didn't raise her hand. I do think I know what her, special, her spiritual gift is, and that's her exhortation, which for those of you who don't know, that means lifting someone up. She's very good at that. She's done that for me so many times that I just, I, I think that's what her spiritual gift is. I'm pretty sure of it. But like I said, if you use these gifts, it glorifies God. It's a blessing to you, 
and you can really help someone that needs it. Um, it's amazing. It's such a blessing, and it shows the glory of God working through you. Now, hunger, that's just one of many afflictions that we have. Um, that's a worldwide one. Some afflictions are local, regional. There's, there's a lot of them out there. Um, lots of things that people are suffering from. And there's a lot of people trying to help themselves to fix these things. It's not working. God helps those that help. Excuse me. God helps the helpless. Um, there's one thing that each and every one of us in here will suffer from at one point in time. Some of us, well, I'd say probably everyone in here has been touched by it already. Um, and we will all suffer from it at one point, and that's death. There's no escaping it. I don't care if you've got millions and billions of dollars. I don't care how good your doctors are. You are helpless to stop death from coming. <clears throat> However, God is not. God has a plan to help with that also. He can help. Even though you're helpless, God has a plan to help the helpless, even when it comes to death. Um, there's a lot of confusion. If, if you leave here right now and you go and turn on your television or pick up maybe the newest uh, self-help books or whatever, there's a lot of confusion right now on what happens after you die or how God's going to save us. Even, even among... Uh, the Christians, it seems there's becoming a lot of confusion um, on how God saves us. Now, if everybody would go to Ephesians, we're going we're to start the end of chapter 1 and go to uh, through chapter 2 a little ways. I think I'm going to start Ephesians 1, about verse 22, and I'm going to read through verse 9. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him his head over all things to the church, which his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world." According to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. In that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Excuse me, I need my water real quick. I personally don't see the confusion. I don't... Uh, I don't think that you need to go beating on people's doors and giving away pamphlets to be saved. I don't think it matters how many Sundays, Sunday mornings, 
Sunday evenings, Wednesday nights, that you come to church. You can't save yourself doing that. It's for, by grace you have been saved through faith. Um, it doesn't matter if your parents or your grandparents were Christians or not. It doesn't matter, is it Paco? It doesn't matter if you worship Paco or Buddha or Allah. You know, there's some more confusion. Everybody thinks all these roads are going to lead to God. No, it doesn't say that in here. I think uh, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. And that was Jesus. That was not Allah or Muhammad or whoever else. There needs to be no confusion. It doesn't matter, you know, if you want to be more like Mother Teresa than Adolf Hitler. That's not going to get you into heaven. That's not going to save you. It doesn't matter if you take a ladder and you go outside and you find a little girl with her kitty cat stuck in a tree and climb up there and get it. That is not going to save you. It doesn't matter how good you are. Those good deeds are like filthy rags. You are helpless. Only God can help the helpless. <clears throat> Nothing that you do can bring your salvation. That's what this, these verses are saying. Nothing that you can do. Jesus did it. It costs you nothing. It's a free gift. It's the gift of God. God gave up all the power in the universe to come to earth, to be a man. He humbled himself in doing so. He came here. He ministered. He taught us. Then he grabbed his cross. He went up. He was beaten and tortured. He went up, went up a mountain, and he was killed. He went to a grave, and three days later, he rose, and he left an empty tomb behind him. And we're getting ready. Here, we'll be celebrating that very soon. We shouldn't just wait for a special day of the year to do it, though. We need to celebrate that all year long. He did that. That is God's gift. That's the path of salvation. There's nothing you can do. You just got to believe God, Jesus, went to the cross and died for your sins. There's not a single thing. It costs you guys nothing. It's a free gift. Nothing. You don't have to fall into these other things. That's religion. That's not Christianity. That's man-made religion. When you think that you have to go to a door and knock on it to get into heaven. Being saved is the gift of God. Jesus paid for it all. Um, by grace, you've been saved through faith. They say that one of the definitions of insanity, I believe, is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. Or at least I've heard it put that way. Um, trying to help yourself be saved and get over, that's insanity. It's not going to work. Only God can help the helpless. I want to I read you guys a little story from the Los Angeles Times. This is from the November 20th, 1988 issue of the Los Angeles Times. There was a little report in there. I thought this was such a great story. A screaming woman trapped in a car dangling from a freeway transition road in East Los Angeles was rescued Saturday morning. The 19-year-old woman apparently fell asleep 
behind the wheel about 12.15 a.m. The car, which plunged through a guardrail, was left dangling by its rear wheel. A half a dozen passing motorists stopped, grabbed some ropes from one of their vehicles, tied the ropes to the back of the woman's car, and hung on until the fire units arrived. A ladder was extended from below to help stabilize the car while firefighters tied the vehicle to tow trucks with cables and chains. Every time we would move the car, said one of the rescuers, she'd yell and scream. She was in pain. It took almost two and a half hours for passerbys, uh, chip officers, tow truck drivers, and firefighters, about 25 people total, to secure the car and pull the woman to safety. It was kind of funny, L.A. County Fire Captain Ross Marshall recalled later. The woman they rescued, she kept saying, I'll do it myself. That's us. When we try to save ourselves, that's us. We're sitting in a car, dangling off a bridge by one tire. The help is out there. Like I said, a lot of us have received it in here. There's a lot of people outside these doors that haven't received it. Um, if you know someone, go find out your spiritual gift and help them today. Let God work through you using that spiritual gift to help them. Um, I'm going to close in prayer in a minute. Pastor Mike's going to come up here, and I know he's going to talk a little bit, and he's going to make an altar call. If you don't know the love of Jesus Christ, if you don't know the gift of God, God's help, I'm asking you, begging you not to make this a decision to delay on. Come up here today. Make that decision. You don't even have to come up here. You can do it. Do it from your pew if you want, just, and you need help, just raise your hand. Everybody here is a minister. Well, somebody will come and pray with you to make that decision. This is the single most important decision of your life. It may not always be the easiest one, but you will be glad you did it. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, gracious God, I ask that you give us strength and courage. Um, if there's someone out here, Father, and they don't know your love, I ask that you just work on their heart and you bring them to you. For those of us, Father, that don't know our spiritual gifts, Father, um, I ask that you uh, re start revealing that to them immediately so that we can bring you glory, Father. And I just thank you again that we can be here to freely talk about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.